Hello, everyone, and thank you again for participating in the legislative wrap up. I'm Demetra Simmons, President and CEO of the Tampa Bay Partnership. The Tampa Bay Partnership is a coalition of regional business leaders joined by a shared commitment to improving Tampa Bay residents' personal and economic well being. Formally incorporated in 1994 and reestablished in 2016, we are a regional research and public policy organization. The partnership works with the region's top employers, along with a diverse group of government and not-for-profit partners to identify and address the most pressing challenges facing our community, including transportation, education, workforce, and other emerging issues. The partnership has been a trusted thought leader since our inception, and our research informs strategies to address these critical issues. As president and CEO, I have the unique opportunity to closely identify the strengths and areas of opportunity in our region, many of which are bolstered by policy and legislative determinations. Solutions are not found in silos, and obstacles faced by our residents do not start, nor do they stop at the county lines. As such, the partnership also convenes and activates organizations around this data. When we work together, we can achieve what no one individual, no one organization, or no one county can accomplish alone. Your work as an elected official is essential to this process. And your willingness to talk about some of the outcomes from the last session in a meaningful way to highlight the progress that can be made in areas of opportunity. I look forward to hearing your, your perspectives and how they connect, connect back to the focus areas identified in the 2023 Regional Competitiveness Report. Welcome to the Institute for Strategic Policy Solutions. My name is Kimberly Jackson and I'm the Executive Director. And on behalf of our exceptional team, we are honored to host the Tampa Bay Area 2023 Legislative Wrap-Up. We've done this in the past for several years because we care about the community and educating them about issues that matter to them. We want to enhance your understanding of policies and want to make sure that you engage with your congressional leaders. Today, we are honored to have the Tampa Bay Partnership sponsor us, and we're grateful for our continued partnership with Al Rochelle, who is an exceptional moderator and knows these men very well. And with that being said, the men I'm referring to is our states, are, are our state senators, Senators Ed Hooper and Senators Dar Senator Daryl Rousson, who are open to having a candid conversation about how session went, their values, and more importantly, what they did right and what they still need to do. With that, I'm going to introduce our senators and thank everyone again for taking the time to join us at ISPS. Daryl Rousson has earned a reputation as a trailblazer in business and in the community. In 1981, he became the first African-American prosecutor in Pinellas County. And in 2003, he was appointed to the newly formed Substance Abuse and Addictions Task Force, for the National Bar Association. Senator Roussan also served as president of the St. Petersburg NAACP from 2000 to 2005. He has also served as a commissioner on both the Taxation and Budget Reform Commission in 2007 and the Constitutional Revision Commission in 2017. In April 2008, Senator Roussan's years of activism, bold leadership, and community service culminated in his being elected to represent Tampa Bay and the Florida House of Representatives. He served the constituents of Tampa Bay as their representative for eight years. Fast forward in 2016, he was elected state senator from District 19, which includes portions of Pinellas and Hillsborough counties. He was most recently reelected to the Florida Senate in 2022 to the newly redrawn District 16. Since Senator Roussan began his tenure in the Florida legislature, he has been regularly listed as one of Tampa Bay's most influential politicians. Senator Roussan serves as the chairman of the Senate Agricultural Committee for the 2020-2022 term. Senator Roussan received a college degree in 1977 from Xavier University in New Orleans and graduated from law school at the University of Florida in 1980. He is married to Angela Roussan and proudly together they raised five boys while he practiced law in the Tampa Bay area with the Rubenstein Law. Senator Ed Hooper, 
was born in North Carolina and moved to Clearwater in 1972, where he resided until 2022, when he and his wife relocated to Trinity. He attended St. Petersburg College, where he studied the, studied fire science emergency medicine studies and served as a firefighter paramedic for the Clearwater Fire Department for 24 years, and then continued his service to the city of Clearwater as a city council member and vice mayor. He spent eight years in the Florida House before retiring in 2014 due to term limits. Initially elected to the Florida Senate District 16 in 2018, he was reelected to the newly numbered Florida Senate District 21 in November of 2022 and continues to serve parts of Pinellas and Pasco counties. He and his wife, Lee, have dedicated their lives to service, servicing this community through their various groups and organizations. All right. Thank you, Kimberly. And thank you so much uh, to the ISPS folks. We've been doing a number of debates and uh, conferences and conversations with them. And I really appreciate to have the opportunity uh, to talk to two gentlemen that I have known for many years when they were representatives in the state legislature, but also now that they are state senators. And I'm joined right now by uh, State Senator Ed Hooper, who's a Republican, and Senator Daryl Roussan, who is a Democrat. Gentlemen, thank you so much for being with me. I really appreciate the time you're spending with us. Thank you, Al. Our pleasure. All right. Well, let's and just because we know each other, I'm going to call you by your first names because otherwise I'll be saying Senator, 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 and we'll, we'll all get confused. So here's what I'd like to do. First of all, I want you to give me an overall grade on this session. Now, I realize you're Republicans and you're Democrats and your priorities may have been different. But from your perspective as a Republican or as a Democrat, give me a grade. And and Ed, I'm going to start with you, an overall grade for the session. Uh, Al, I'm going to, I won't call you Mr. Rochelle. Rochelle I'll call you call you me Al. <laughs> um, you know, we did, uh, if you just want a number, I'm going to say the grade is 90. 90, okay. Daryl, what, what grade would you give it? Well, I'm going to split it. I'm going to give it an A for the budget and then a C for policy. That's an if A for the budget because what? Because you got it done and because it's a record or I'm, I'm just elaborate on that. We got it done. It was a record, but reserves are very important. Uh, Chairman Hooper, who sits on the TED committee, well knows what I'm talking about. It was a record reserve which means that if we get into trouble, we've got something to fall back on. So it's interesting because a lot of the state policy, and we're going to get into the real specifics here in a minute, seem to be shaded by what was going on around the nation. And we'll get that when we talk about education and a few other things like that. But let me go through some of these numbers so that for those of you that are watching us, I kind of wonder, well, how much money did we talk about here? It's about $117 billion. And there's no way you're going to contemptually figure out how much that is. Th that's a lot of money. Um, and uh, that money was going to be split up many, many, many different ways. So I want to start out with talking about the common ground legislation. And as I'm looking at what was passed, I'm going to go through each one of these, and I'd like to get a comment. First of all, I look at $711 million for affordable housing. Daryl, why is affordable housing always seem to be, uh, it's so difficult to get it where you want it to go and not even able to get as much money as you would like? Why is that so tough? Well, this year, it was a bipartisan effort. Uh, Senator Kaladiu did a good job on that Senate Bill 102. I was proud to be the first co-introducer of that bill, which created record spending. We know we have a housing crisis. It's been coming for years because of the popularity of moving to the state of Florida and the market itself. So it's been hard to stop raiding the Sadowski Trust Fund, but we didn't do that this year. We fully funded it. And we've created opportunities both for the developer and the consumer uh, with this record spending in affordable housing. Ed, give me a definition of affordable housing, because in talking to some of my cohorts about the affordable housing situation, what do we mean when we say affordable housing, Ed? Well, Mal, I think the time has come for the word affordable to be changed into attainable. And I say that, you know, affordable housing is a formula. If you make a hundred or plus whatever the, the number is of the median income of the area where you're li living, uh, that qualifies you for affordable housing. 
as, as Senator Roussan indicated, this year, not only did the Sadowski Trust Fund be fully spent on as intended by the statute, we added more money for workforce housing, for hometown heroes, for, for developers to dedicate a piece of their developments to those that may meet that definition of what we used to call, what I used to call affordable. I think attainable housing is, is a much better used term for, for the needs of the citizens of Florida. Bottom line is you got some additional dollars. I've also talked to some developers who are figuring out unique and creative ways to make sure that you can still have high-end housing in a structure, but still have affordable housing in, in other parts of it that doesn't de detract, if you know what I mean, from, from yes. the overall price of the property, which is what developers are always concerned about. The environment, $1 billion. In the many, many years that I've been on the air, it, it seems like you could be spending a trillion dollars on environmental needs and you'd never be able to meet what needs to be done in Florida. Ed, a uh, billion dollars, that seems like a lot of money. Half of that to the Everglades, is that right? 575 million for the Everglades. What will that so. money be used for? A variety of things, Al. I mean, it, you know, you say we could spend a trillion, we spent a billion years ago, we spent nothing. So uh, we're, we're going the right direction. And we'll start with something as simple as a priority of the of President Pasadomo, creating and funding the Wildlife Corridor of Florida to carve out a, a piece of Florida from Southwest Florida all the way to the Georgia line that we call the Wildlife Corridor that, that doesn't take away the habitat uh, of all the, the animals that we all love to see and, and uh, make sure that they're still around, be it the panther or a variety. But Lake Okeechobee is uh, responsible for a lot. And that's where the blue-green algae occurs. The Kissimmee River is a huge polluter of that lake as it flows through central Florida and flows into the lake. So we're, we're now spending money to treat not only the properties north of Lake Okeechobee, but south of Lake Okeechobee as it flows into the Everglades and to make sure that that pristine, uh, what is now a tourist attraction mm -hmm. uh, stays that way and is not uh, a dried up uh, thing that we should have addressed years ago. Another common ground issue, 5% pay raise for state employees. I know state employees and I know teachers and they were saying it's about time. Daryl, what do you think about that? I think it is about time. They've gone without significant raises for several budget cycles and the Senate president to her credit felt it was priority, and we did it. And that was a bipartisan effort. Now, we tried to get the insurance industry fixed, or if that's the proper word for it, with the Insure Accountability Act. The bottom line is that, I'll give you an example. For, I'll use my own example. My insurance went from about $2,500 to $6,000 in one cycle. And, and I know a lot of other homeowners that are feel like they're being priced out. The Insure Accountability Act, they say, be patient because eventually we'll see the rates go down. Why will we see the rates go down and when? Daryl? Well, if you believe what certain folks in the legislature have set out, and that is that litigation is the problem, then rates should have dropped like a, a heavy rock but they have not dropped, they've increased. And that's because we haven't addressed the real issue. It's not litigation, it's lack of regulation and lack of punishment on the part of insurance carriers who delay, deny, and sometimes lowball claims. Uh, all over the news in Tampa Bay, it's been stories of Fort Myers and Lee County uh, Collier County, the, the counties that were very hard hit by Ian that are still trying to get claims done. And it's uh, some of it is the fault of the insurance carriers, but we keep punishing the consumers. Well, how, how do you how do you switch that around? Because the insurance, if that, the insurers don't like it, they just pull out like farmers. Well, hopefully, you know, Jimmy Patronus is going to take a good hard look at it. He said he would, and I trust that he will. Um, you, you you have to have a, a, a whipping stick. You have to have something over their heads uh, to hold them accountable. And I think that that happens when you allow the consumer the opportunity 
to hire competent counsel to get through some of these uh, tough policy languages and coverage issues. Right. Um, I don't. I don't know how all these issues hit me personally, but I, I was. I, we had to sue our insurance carrier from a storm damage from two years ago, and 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 finally got the settlement, which ended up costing the insurance company twice the cost of what the roof was. So I mean that that's a big deal. So let's move on to stuff that's that that it, that it was contentious, and I'm going to use a quote from Andrew Spar, the Florida Education Association president, in their annual legislative review, and and. Uh, this is brutal, but I'll read it just what it says. Let's be real. This was the worst legislative session we have ever seen for Florida's public schools, colleges, and universities, and for the people who learn and work in them. With massive giveaways to vouchers and charter schools, limiting the right of educators, and a complete failure to address the most pressing issue facing Florida students, the massive teacher and staff shortage, lawmakers have left Florida's students and families behind. That's the union speaking. Daryl, I'll stick with you on that one. Was it the worst legislative session for public schools in the history of Florida? Well, I don't know that I would go that far to say it, it was the worst, but it was certainly bad. Uh, the expansion of vouchers beyond low-income families to middle-class and upper-income families being able to take advantage of vouchers when they don't need it. Uh, the example of some private schools saying we can't leave money on the table. We've got to increase tuition so that we can take advantage of this uh, opportunity to gouge uh, parents. Uh, certainly parental control was another issue. Uh, removing books from shelves, uh, attacking diversity, equity, and inclusion when communities all across this state have worked hard to be respected, including gender justice, women who've worked hard to be respected and included in the political process. Uh, so I certainly think it was a bad session for public education. Ed, you would agree with that or not? No, well, you know, uh, first of all, Senator Roussan and I uh, uh, have known each other a long time and I respect him immensely. We have a slightly different view. This was a record funding year for public school students, uh, far exceeding anything that they've ever enjoyed before. Now, some of the issues he talked about are real. Um, I know from the Republican uh, members of, of the caucus, the, the one thing that was emphasized was let's put parents in charge of the children and not school boards, administrators, or, or, or maybe even at the teacher level, um, in some areas, we may have reached what comfort level would have been, but public schools are not going to go away. They're going to always be there. And, and this year, at least, they were funded at a level that's unprecedented in the state of Florida per student funding. So that was $8,648, which was up $405 from last year. You know, getting feedback from, from parents the people say, well, this is common sense. If the district, if the state is going to pay $8,000 for my student, why can't I take that $8,000 and my money and put it where I want it to go, especially if my kids happen to be in a school that is failing or a school that's not doing as well? Do we know how many students might take advantage of this or, or, or in the planning, how many did they think would take advantage of it? I, I don't know that we know that number. It will be determined in about three weeks, I believe, uh, when school starts again. But um, it's, you know, Al, one of the things that that voucher, uh, a lot of people, a lot of parents will use that. The one thing that will deter a lot of movement is nothing in that voucher is, is dedicated to transportation. So if you're going to take a voucher, move your child out of the district where they're zoned, you got to get them there and you got to pick them up. So I think that will uh, stop a lot of the mass uh, exodus out of the this district school and go where you want to, because some parents simply can't afford to take time off of their job to take their kids to school or pick them up. Yeah. Like the, uh, the plan was 2.2 billion this year and possibly 3 billion 
next year. And and uh, I've talked to a number of private schools and the private schools have not seen a huge influx. Uh, I believe the archdiocese, uh, the, the Catholic church, uh, uh, where they were only predicting maybe a two or three percent increase in in the number of people that would actually show up. So, on the national level, this whole idea of parental involvement and accountability it, it, it's gone on a national level. So it's not just Florida that's experiencing this. So how do you how do you let parents know? For example, I did a debate with the school board uh, when they were running had school board candidates, and some of the national issues really were not we're not occurring here locally, but there's this kind of this notion, well, parents, I don't have any right because I know that the PTAs have the right to look at books. We know that there's a normal feedback cycle that occurs between teachers and counselors. So it, it, is a lot of this information about what is changed in the educational system, it, it, is it real or is it hype? Because everybody said, you're going to take off all the books off of the shelves. And Ed, I'll let you continue with that. And then I'll go to Daryl. Well, it, you know, uh, and we may have a slight difference of opinion. I, I, I truly believe that, um, and I know session before last, we, we changed to where from kindergarten through third grade, that to me, there's no need to have any chat about sexual orientation or gender identity. There are books on the shelves that uh, may, to me, confuse a young student more than help them understand. I think we expanded it now through eighth grade. Uh, I'm comfortable with that. That's, you know, go to school to learn, uh, to be educated so you can go out in the real world or go to college or go to technical school and learn how to get a job. And um, you, you'll learn that other stuff once you get to high school or college. Okay. Daryl, your reaction? Well, I think, it's, I think it's a lot of hype. And I also think that parents elect school board members. There's a direct connection there. And the school board members are professionals, some of them educators, some of them bring other talents to the table, but they're elected by the people to represent them and to exert control over policy. I don't feel children are being groomed and I don't know what professional certified teacher purposes in their mind to groom a child of early age looking to learn and misuse that position of authority and a position of enlightenment about education. Uh, students are smarter today than ever before. In fact, I go to my young people, my kids, and ask them how to navigate the internet, how to navigate social media. <laughs> but they're, they're, they're smarter today. And I think that they can look through some of these materials that are being held. And to Senator Hooper's point, we have worked very well together, both in the House and in the Senate, and I respect him mightily, but we might have a few differences uh, of degree in policy matters. But we worked very well together in, in the budget process this year, uh, particularly when St. Pete College that owns the Palladium needed additional funding to renovate and remodel and make that building more attractive. Uh, and I want to thank Senator Hooper for his input and his help on getting that done. That Palladium, I mean, that that is a treasure. I mean, absolutely. I've, I've hosted a lot of events there as well as everybody else does. It's a, it's a, a flashback to 40, 50, 60 years ago, but it's also modern enough that it meets all of the needs of many of the people that go there for their for the banquets and for the weddings and all those kinds of things that are going on. So let, let's continue on with this conversation. Florida positioned itself, thanks to the governor and the legislature, no one person can take credit for it, despite what politicians tend to tell you. It's, it's all a, a group effort along the way. We did not do things the way the rest of the nation did. So how far did our students fall behind as compared to the uh, rest of the country? Because if, if I'm if I'm reading correctly some of these studies, it appears that because we opened up sooner than a lot of other school districts around the country, that our kids were better off. And maybe the, a, a second part of that question is, how do we make up for that that year's worth of learning that we lost when the reading and math scores and all the scores also tumbled at the same time, Daryl? Well, that's a good question, but we still have to come at it every year to make sure that our students are learning what they need to learn to perform better on standardized testing. 
that gets them into college and gets them into career technical institutions. Um, I think we just have to keep at it. Uh, Ed, same question to you. What do we do to try to to, to bridge that gap if possible? Uh, I agree with everything that Senator Roussan just said. And I also would think that, you know, uh, our school kids are, are really, they're influenced by so many outside forces today. They all carry that technology in their pocket or purse that, you know, something as simple as getting our school kids off of TikTok or, or putting their cell phones in a, a mode that they can't stare at that all day. They can actually listen to the lesson and maybe learn from what their professor or teacher is trying to teach them. But I think we are slightly ahead of the rest of the nation because we did uh, get our, our state back open and, and functioning as close as we could to normal, uh, a little quicker than the rest of the country. Now, a number of months ago, I did a debate or more, more, more or less a conversation with a lot of the mayors from the beach communities in Pinellas County. And one of the things that they were really upset about, and I, I'm kind of paraphrasing, that all elected offices in the state of Florida now must be partisan. And they were they're, they're very angry with that because they thought that, uh, especially in the beach communities, whether you're a Democrat or Republican doesn't even doesn't even matter. However, you see it in the bigger cities like in Tampa and in St. Petersburg, where it was obvious that it was the Democrat versus the Republican. Why must they all be partisan races? Ed? I'm going to preface my answer with saying again, uh, I am not the best policy person in the legislature. I like appropriations. Um, oh, okay. Some of the policy that we do is um, uh, it passes. There, there's many bills that pass that both Senator Roussan and I might have been uh, uh, in a position to not favor. Uh, but at the end of the day, the majority tends to rule. I, I think the biggest thing we did was to eliminate the nonpartisan status of school board members, which I, I don't know that that's going to make our, our student scores or, or our public education better, but it is what it is. And there may come a day that we may have to revisit that and change that back to what it was previously. And I would not be shocked if that happens within the next five years. Daryl, do you feel the I same way we, about that? Well, I hope we do revisit it. Uh, education should be nonpartisan. It should be about good policy, not not good politics. And I think that we made a mistake mm. by making it partisan. Uh, I voted against that bill for those very reasons. One other area of concern, and this is not just the state of Florida. Uh, it, it is all over the country. We have a lot of job vacancies, and particularly in the state of Florida, uh, according to uh, the state, there are 16,000 state job vacancies right now. Uh, Daryl, are, are, is this a critical situation yet, or, or is this just because we've seen a lot of other companies that can't fill the positions they have, not just state governments? Well, it is a critical situation, particularly in the Department of Corrections, where we're experiencing huge vacancies, although we've come back to eliminating a good portion of those, there's still staffing shortages that create emergency situations and unsafe situations for our correction officers. Also, the nursing shortage uh, we see in healthcare, hospitals struggling to hire, retain good nurses, and we need to do more in that area. Um, stat shortages are very real. Uh, that's why I support the unions and their apprenticeship programs, getting more young kids into the pipeline so that they can do these technical jobs. Uh, everybody must come to the table to create solutions to stop the shortages. It kind of surprises me that there wasn't a greater emphasis on apprentices earlier on, and and now there is because we're kind of in a in a labor shortage. Why do you think we didn't take it seriously before? It's just human nature. Sometimes you respond to the crises and not to the growing trend. Let's talk about something else, uh, and maybe you guys can and and sort this out for me because I'm not so sure I fully understand what the new rules are for gun ownership 
gun registration, concealed carry, open carry, all those phrases. Uh, again, a lot of this stuff whipped up in the national news, which people tend to watch national news and go, oh, that's what it's like for me here in Florida when it may not be that way at all. Daryl? Well, there's a real gun violence problem problem in America and in this state. I am not anti-Second Amendment. I am not anti-gun, but I'm anti-gun violence. We need to do more in the area of education, training, and prevention. That's why I was very proud to be allowed to be the only senator, either Republican or Democrat, to do a floor amendment on the budget that included an anti-gun violence grant program of $10 million to help organizations that are doing good work in anti-gun violence programs. Uh, permitless carry, when we passed it, we know that every state that's passed this type of legislation has seen a 20 to 30% increase in gun violence because people don't understand open carry versus permitless carry. And everyone who carries ought to be trained. So what the, is the, it? But the bill for? passed the legislature and it went to the governor's desk, but he vetoed it. And I was very disappointed in that veto. <laughs> he vetoed the education part of it? Yes. The, the, you know, he vetoed the grant program that would have enhanced organizations already dealing in gun violence, anti-gun violence. Mm hmm Ed, what what did you think? How did you vote on on those gun bills? No, I voted uh, for the bills uh, as presented, and and to me, here's the difference, Al. Is if you if under the old policy that you had to take a training course and put, submit your fingerprints, go through the process, have a background check. If you weren't allowed to purchase a gun under the old rules, you still cannot purchase one under the new rules legally. Um, now I, I would hope that everyone who's going to go purchase a gun would educate themselves, would take a class. I have a concealed carry permit and I will probably renew that because there are states that I travel to that, that still require that permit for reciprocity. So to me, it's a wise investment to keep that on me with me. Cause when I travel in my vehicle, uh, yes, I may have a a weapon somewhere in that vehicle or concealed on me. So if you weren't allowed to have a gun legally before, you still cannot have one now. Uh, there is no open carry in Florida. Um, right. I don't know that there will be, but uh, if you want to conceal a weapon for the protection of you, your business, or your family, and you can legally purchase a gun, you can do that today without having a, some call it a government per permission slip, but I call it the concealed carry permit. All right, I'm looking at, at my list of, uh, it was amazing when I looked at, there were 200 bills. It's just like, it, it, yeah, 200 new laws and 300 bills. Uh, just that number of bills when I was trying to go through them to, to figure out what to, to look at, uh, to talk about. One thing I am curious about, and, and I was trying to figure out, $109 million for the Florida State Guard. Ed, what, what is the definition of the Florida State Guard? Who are they? Who pays for them? When are they activated? Are these people that are in the National Guard already? or who? The Florida State Guard was a, a priority request of the governor's office and is similar to the National Guard, but it is not the National Guard. It is a state of Florida organization that recruits and trains and outfits, whether it be uh, uh, air, airplanes, helicopters, equipment, armories uh, that are uh, subject to the call of the governor only. They cannot go outside the state of Florida. They are not subject to National Guard call up. It's, it's basically like having the National Guard, but it's only dedicated to the state of Florida. They're un, unpaid. They get uh, some reimbursement for training. Uh, it is voluntarily, uh, and there's uh, an attempt to, to create an organization of 1,500 state guard, guardsmen or guardswomen uh, to be ready to address any emergency that would come about in the state, whether it's hurricane, whether it's natural disaster, whether it's civil unrest, whatever the call may be, that there may or may not be adequate National Guardsmen to take care of that role. Uh-huh. 
Let me ask another question. These things kind of go through my mind real quickly. Daryl, let me ask you, because beach renourishment we know is really, really important. So what's going on with the the delay that's going on in Pinellas County with the Army Corps of Engineers? And I guess it's been almost a two-year delay from getting uh, many of our beaches renourished. Daryl? I'm not sure about that. Uh, I don't know a lot about that topic, uh, that particular issue. I, I do. Ed, go ahead. The Corps of Engineers, which is a federal agency, uh, not the easiest to deal with, uh, typically, they have decided that uh, now would be the time for their policy to have 100% of beach properties give them a a permanent perpetual easement so that they can do what they need to do to re-nourish our beaches. If one property or one property owner holds out from that, they are not going to come in and re-nourish our beaches. And and that is the worst punishment, uh, egregious act to me for a a state that relies on tourism and our, especially in in Tampa Bay, some of the incredible beaches we have uh, and to see what's happened with storms and erosion uh, for for one federal agency to demand a permanent perpetual easement or we're not going to pump sand um, is a punishment to Florida. This is another question that I want to ask that I, I want to be careful how I, how I ask this, but again, because so much is, attention has been paid on the national level and whether or not our, our, our governor who is now running for president, um, the, the question is, and I'll just phrase it this way. Did this, did the legislature get so focused? these national issues that the governor was bringing up that maybe they lost sight of what needed to be done in the state of Florida? This is kind of an open-ended question. I'm not, not an opinion one way or another. Ed, Ed, answer that. And then Daryl, I want to get your answer. Okay. Oh, well, I know the governor did have some, as he visited other states and, and uh, suggestions were offered, I know that he did have some priorities. I don't think that it came at the expense of paying attention to what our state needed. A lot of the issues were I think clearly some things that Florida did need. So yes, he had uh, he had a very robust agenda, uh, and he had a very successful session. Uh, but I think Florida as a whole had a very successful session, and some of the agenda not only benefits Florida but may benefit uh, other states as well. Daryl, same question for you. Well, I do think that we engaged in a lot of culture wars, uh, things that we didn't need to deal with, like the bathroom police, where you can challenge someone if you feel that their genitals don't match the bathroom that they're in. Uh, We should have done more in kitchen table issues, like the economy, property insurance, uh, those kinds of things, transportation, infrastructure. I was very happy, though, that we finally put enough funding to take care of the Osborne Reef, which is the tire removal uh, issue going on in South Florida uh, that started in the 70s with the stringing together of uh, used tires. Um, And like Senator Hooper said, the wildlife corridor was huge in terms of the environment and also kid care, health care for children was very huge. So there were a lot of good things that happened and I think we could have done more, but I applaud the Senate president for the housing bill and uh, look forward to working with her in the future. And I look forward to working with Senator Hooper uh, on issues important to our county, our counties. What do you think is the biggest issue that our, our two counties face here? And I'm just using two, but it's actually the whole five five county area that's considered to be Tampa Bay. What 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 is our most pressing need? Right I now, think transportation. Go, go ahead, ahead. Daryl. Uh, go ahead. I, I would put transportation up there as top priority. In fact, just the other day, the Hillsborough County Commission approved rezoning of land in southern Hillsborough County where they're going to build 1,800 homes in Waimama, which is just barely out of my district. And we I don't know that we have the infrastructure to handle an influx of 1,800 more homes without dealing with transportation issues, congestion, uh, clogged arteries that lead people to not want to commute 
in order for to get jobs and things like that. So I would put transportation up there. Ed, for you, number one, transportation as well? Uh, transportation is important. Right now, Al, I, I believe that the property insurance crisis is still uh, one of the number one issues that's impacting uh, not only every one of us, but every Floridian, whether you own property or you rent a property, somebody's got to pay for that increased insurance bill. And you'll do so either in your insurance policy or in rent you have to pay. So yeah, I think this next session, which starts in January, we are going to, again, deal in any way possible with how do we attract more uh, insurers to come into the state? Uh, but the rates, and, and you know, when we passed the last insurance bill, the experts told us the actuaries for all these companies are going to take 18 months to come up with the actual exposure and, and those rates will reflect that. Well, we're about seven months into that 18 months. So there's still pain to be had, had but, but the pain, we can't tolerate much more pain. We have all just about reached our threshold, as you indicated with your own personal policy. Uh, it, it, it's it's off the chart. So insurance is still going to be uh, in the top three issues that I think we deal with next session. No, I and I notice. agree with that. I agree with that. But uh, I would also add that there's so many issues that we need to deal with. Um, and for me, session starts October 9th which is the first committee week and we'll get a chance to start vetting some of these good bills and the budget coming through. But I would also caution us to look at, again, mental health and substance abuse. Mental health is very important uh, for our first responders, for our students, and for community-minded uh, people. So we kind of glossed over, we talked about the education in the uh, elementary and high school level. Um, Daryl, from your perspective, what's going on with the colleges? And I know that, that I, I know from personal experience that many of the colleges, particularly the, the so-called junior colleges in Hillsborough and Pinellas, they're having real trouble uh, attracting students. Well, it's not just attracting students, it's attracting competent and professional faculty. Uh, we've worked hard for certain institutions to reflect the diversity of the communities that they operate in to reflect fairness and inclusion, both in contracting opportunities. University of South Florida certainly is going to give diversity, equity, and inclusion an important role in the building of this new football stadium so that everyone can benefit from the economy being impacted positively. I think that the perception nationally is that Florida does not respect diversity, equity, and inclusion. And that and those have become curse words in Tallahassee. But I'm going to continue to work hard with those members of the legislature that see the value of a beautiful and diverse university. I don't think anybody would argue that diversity is necessary. How, how, how do you... How do you get around the negative implications of, like you say, the, the, the diversity, equity, inclusion? It's gotten that on a national level and everybody in there. This is, I guess, the question I always have as a broadcaster, and you folks know this. I'm a common sense kind of guy. And I look at things and I just go, common sense tells you that if you are more diverse, you're going to have a better learning experience. You're going to have a better cultural experience. You're going to better understand your neighbors. How do you do it without the negative implications that have come with that? You just work it and hope that these institutions value the value of diversity and don't get caught up in the technical phrase of what it's called, but go to the substance of what it intends. Ed, same same question for you because I well, know this is a, this is a hot button issue. It is, and first of all, our common sense is not very common. Um, unfortunately, I wish it were more common. Um, but you know, not many years ago, we all thought of uh, of a radical university being Berkeley, and under the University of California system, and that's where all the uh, uh, different things were happening that. Uh, 
whether that made you a better student or more prepared to go out in the real world, I don't know. In Florida, I think that we've seen what, um, what New College kind of was and kind of where it's trying to, to morph into today is going to be really dramatic. And, and uh, it, it's, it's painful to watch some of that, to see some of, uh, just looking at some of the uh, previous New College courses and, and uh, programs and curriculum that, uh, was that helping our state university system? Probably not. I mean, we're, I think we're blessed with the number one state university system ranked in the country. Uh, I know our, our state colleges, uh, they're not junior colleges anymore. They're now, they all want to be a state college. Mm -hmm. uh, they're having to learn new ways to attract and train and educate their students and be, a, a, whether it's a four-year degree or whether it's technical training to get them workforce ready. Uh, I know I'm meeting with President Williams of St. Pete College this week, and, and uh, we chat often about trying to find uh, the right combination of, of uh, preparedness, whether it's educational or, or workforce training, to get uh, our population trained and ready to do whatever they choose to do. So let's talk about the hurricane preparedness, and then and then I'll have one question on the backside of that as well. Um, we, I used to work in the Fort Myers area, and uh, used to go to Sanibel all the time, and family went out there on vacations and stuff, and it just makes you cry now when you see what happens to that. And then knowing in the back of your mind that that could have come up along our area and hit all of our Madeira, Indian Rocks, St. Pete Beach, Clearwater. Are we really ready for that? No, we're not even close to ready. And I don't know that we'll ever be ready. That storm was our storm. That was coming as a gift to us. And, and uh, we would still be uh, probably, well, as devastated or more so than Southwest Florida, just because we have Tampa Bay. And, um, you know, we've dodged a bullet for a little over 100 years. Uh, for a direct hit. And, and whether it's an Indian mound, I don't care what it is. I hope that continues. But, you know, after Hurricane Michael in the Panhandle some five or six years ago, we're still spending money at the state level to try to get that part of Florida back on its feet. We'll be doing that to Southwest Florida for the next four, five, six years, trying to get that community restored to where it was and where they can to be what that area was, which is a spectacular, you're right, it's a spectacular part of Florida. And to see what it was the day after that hurricane was yeah. sickening and, and, and those folks are gonna take a long time to recover. And I know that the state will do whatever we have to do to be a partner, but also to furnish a lot of the funding that especially for the infrastructure and the transportation, the bridge networks to get them back to where they can become what they were. And Daryl, I was I just know, thinking, go ahead, Daryl. I, I agree with Senator Hooper. We're not prepared, but I don't think you can ever be overly prepared for a storm of the century. And also we need to encourage people to take advantage of the tax exemptions that we created for purchasing hurricane equipment or for hurricane proofing your home and your property. Uh, we do that so that we can be more prepared uh, in the event we get the storm of the century. And Senator Hooper is right. We've dodged a bullet for 100 years, but we cannot afford to be lackadaisical. And let me ask one last political question. This one really is political. Darrell, we'll start with you. Are the Democrats finally going to le level the, the playing field up there in Tallahassee and get as many people in the House and the Senate as as the Republicans have in the past, or are we still a red state? The pendulum must swing back. The question is, how soon will it swing back? The answer is, we must continue to encourage people to look at our policies, look at what we're saying that government ought to be about, and compare that to the Republicans running. Uh, I've learned in my 15 years in the legislature that there are great policies of common interest and therefore, I seek to collaborate on those things that we share common ground on while trying to stand strong 
on certain things like fully funding public education, not attacking union dues deductions, uh, increasing mental health and substance abuse dollars, working towards an attainable, to use Senator Hooper's words, housing issues. Uh, that's where I choose to concentrate my efforts. All right, Senator Hooper, you got the last last word on this. Well, it looks like, and just recently, the uh, voter registration numbers still seem to be growing in favor of the Republican Party. I think there's a 500 plus thousand uh, voter registration advantage to the Republican Party, which historically, for as long as time's been counted, the Democratic Party had the majority of the registered voters. So uh, I don't know why that is. I don't know if the influx of people coming to, to is more Republican leaning uh, voter, new voters. Uh, but I think that trend is going to continue for uh, a while. But like Senator Roussan said, the pendulum always swings. We just don't know the, the when the swing is going to occur to tip it the other way. But it typically it'll, it'll happen someday. I just don't think it'll be in the very near future. And then don't forget those huge independents whose numbers are growing at a faster rate than both the Democrats and the Republicans. I think people get people just generally get frustrated with government when they don't understand it. But you gentlemen have been very helpful uh, for our program today. I really appreciate it. You kind of let me go freewheeling on this. And and there are a lot of great programs that we didn't even have time to mention. Uh, I want to congratulate both of you. I, I know you both personally. You're 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 great people. And I, I I'm proud to call you. Uh, my representatives and my senators because you work so hard for us and, and I appreciate what you do. So don't remember, just remember you're back to work in October as uh, Daryl so wonderfully put it. So Ed Hooper and Daryl Rasson, thank you so much for your time. Thank back you, to you, Val. Kimberly. And thank you all for watching our program. We hope the ISPS programs are inspirational to you because I know they are to me. 